In this week's episode, I'm joined by Jennifer Brown, founder of Jennifer Brown Consulting, keynote speaker, and best-selling author of How to Be an Inclusive Leader. This week, our conversation is about company benefits for reproductive travel, how hiring refugees is good for business, and more. Hey there, my name is Bernadette Smith. Welcome to Five Things in 15 Minutes, my weekly show where I bring good vibes to DEI. That is good vibes to diversity, equity, and inclusion with a little dash of corporate social responsibility. What I've found is that there are lots of news stories about what's going wrong in the world and lots of negative data, but there are also a lot of things going right. That's what I like to focus on. I search for DEI stories that we can be inspired by and learn from. My hope is to inspire you to experiment with some of these inclusive actions and policies within your own organization to help you build a more inclusive world. Let's get started. Jennifer, will you please introduce yourself? Hey, thank you, Bernadette. I'm Jennifer. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I've been in this work a long time. So, you know, I think we need to back up and say, you know, the ebbs and flows of change are never easy to navigate, but they certainly uh, make us better practitioners, especially the challenging times. Yeah. Thank you for for saying that to get us started, because, you know, I was going to ask you about that. We see things like the Supreme Court overturning affirmative action, companies being sued for their DEI programs. I mean, it's just kind of a mess out there. What what are some of the the things that you're hearing from your clients or some of the challenges you're you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, we're in the midst of a big retrenchment um and a lot of fear on the part of advocates, both personal individuals, a lot of us that are doing this work, but also on the part I think of institutions and leadership. It's not a moment of courage in many cases. Um I think the courage that we wish we would have seen as the challenges rolled through. But, you know, it's a it's a hard reminder that the bottom line kind of, you know, wins out and that business is business at the end of the day. So, you know, I think we have to get really savvy with how we implement change and be really practical. And I think in some cases, kind of going back to basics, Bernadette, it's really, it's really interesting. I think in hindsight, we really sprinted forward the last couple of years and assumed that so many were along the ride with us um, and that momentum would just continue. And of course, for every action, there's a reaction. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we could see that we would need to perhaps go back to go forward because we accelerated so intensely. And, you know, we were all very excited to, you know, be a part of that acceleration. But I think we should have expected this time um, to go back and say, so who did we leave behind? What did we not address? Where were we not inclusive um, in the perhaps the way that would have brought people along that now have kind of, you know, unfortunately polarized to become you know, the resistance to these concepts that we know are so good for all of us. So we have to, I think, look inward and say, you know, where did we, where perhaps did we miscalibrate um, and, and really get better at what we do? And I think more, more inclusive with our strategies, ironically enough. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the, I love your podcast. And one of the things you always talk about on your podcast is that everybody has a diversity story, right? And I think that, in the past couple of years, it was pretty easy to forget that everybody has a diversity story. And I think that there were people who felt left out. Yeah. And, you know, even even people of even when I, I think, as we've talked about before, your own uh, people with mm-hmm. privilege, they obviously have a seat at the table, but they need to feel included in the conversation in a way that they're not dismissed. Right. Right. And that's your your sp- secret sauce in the work it that is. you do. It is. I try to hold space for that. Um, but you're right, Bernadette. It's um, That's why I keep trying to broaden the definition of diversity uh, because we have so many identities, both in- visible and invisible. We also have identities of privilege and advantage depending on the system that we're in. Some systems privilege some of us and some do not. It mm-hmm. depends on you know who we are in that system and how we're regarded in that system traditionally. So 
there's always something I think we can do to be both the ally um, and utilize the privilege, which is the definition of allyship, I think, to uplift others, break through barriers. But there's also other times that we need the allyship. You know, as an LGBTQ plus person, you and I, you know, we know the power of that and how transformative it can be. Mm -hmm. So my message these days is let's not weaponize the P word. Let's really just talk about it as something that is just something that we all carry. We all carry different forms of it and depends on the day and the situation. But I think every moment our job really is to notice the system that is in play. Are we an insider or an outsider in that system or somewhere in between? And how do we want to interact with that system? How, what do we want to bring to, as a change agent? We may be bringing our voice as somebody who's been traditionally marginalized, and we may be bringing our insider status to raise attention around something, shine a light on something, have a courageous conversation. So I think if we could all, all of us could look at the ingredients of who we are in this way, I think we would be more useful. And the challengers from the inside are super important at this moment because that's, I think, where this tussle is going on, you know, this for the soul and the spirit of equity and equality. I mean, that's where it's happening. So, you know, the 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 power, the rooms with people with quote unquote institutional power, defined power in that way, um, that's where some serious honesty and advocacy could go a long way to impacting thousands of people um, around the world. I mean, decisions get made there that ripple out widely. So I think we have to figure out what are those conversations, what's happening in those conversations, how comfortable are people advocating? There's a lot of awkwardness, a lot of fear, a lot of, I'm going to say the wrong thing, a lot of, I don't want to break with the group and I don't want to like, you know, kick the system that benefits me. And so there's a lot of Again, a lot of that binary thinking around win lose, and I don't think it's that. I actually think there's something additive here that we can accomplish. Well, I love how you you basically described a framework. You know, starting with the question: Am I an insider or outsider? So I hope that you have that framework, like <laughs> as a one pager PDF that someone can download. Because folks listening on the podcast, rewind. And write that down because it really was a very simple way for folks to sort of think about how do I fit into all of this, you know, and to find their space. So, um, so thank you for sharing that with all of us. You know, so in this week's Five Things newsletter, I wrote about a previous guest on the show called Celia Daniels. And when she was on the show introducing herself, she, she happens to be a South Asian trans woman, but she also mentioned that she loves music. She has a 25-year-old daughter, and she started talking about her other passions and how her trans identity is only one small part of her whole self. And I think, you know, when, and I certainly am starting to feel that way more and more about my queer identity, and I just think that uh, with places like the International Chess Federation banning trans women this week kind of reduce us to just these singular parts of, of who we are. Um, and we need to get back to finding our common humanity. And I really think the framework that you, you laid out actually gives folks a tool to do that. Thank you. I feel inspired now. Thank you. <laughs> my Thank my you. brain works in lead magnets sometimes. And I love it. I when, love it. <laughs> okay, let's move into this week's good vibes. The first story is about the trans handyman, a DIY fix it influencer on TikTok named Mercury Stardust. She has gained over 2 million followers, has a new book out, and is just, I watched some of the videos, and she is just a breath of fresh air, absolutely amazing. Did you get to check out Mercury, Jennifer? No, but how cool. Got to see it to be it. So just the role modeling is so powerful there. Also, just the the embracing of the full identity um, publicly, you know, I'm in awe as a Gen Xer, particularly, I'm not sure what generational cohort they're from, but like, it's so, it is so inspirational to challenge myself to watch the full embracing and authenticity of identity that is happening amongst younger generations. And so I don't know, actually, I shouldn't assume the age cohort, but it's just, to me, these are huge differences between the generations, like in the LGBTQ community, the way we speak about our identity, the way we incorporate it, the way we insist on it yes. um, 
is so beautiful. And, and the assumption that I think we need to believe, which is there's so many people that need to see somebody like this and feel I'm not, I, I could do that. I could be that. And, you know, I, I'm just, I'm super inspired. And our, our generation is, I think still wrestles a lot with the closet around identity. I mean, I think the last statistic from HRC is half of us are still closeted in our professional lives, you know, and that is inconceivable (laughs) to the up and coming generation. So it's really, really exciting. It is. And, And one of the things that she said about all the people that are writing in or commenting in to ask for advice is that their common theme is that these are people who don't have anyone else to ask advice from, you know, and I just think that filling that void as well. And it just kind of makes me sad that we don't like to make ourselves vulnerable enough to ask for help. And so I think that there's a bigger piece that's being played here as well. So anyway, a big, big new fan of oh, Marie Marie Stardust. Check them out. And you know, the book bands are so sad for that exact reason. It's sort of like you assume you're alone just because we humans, I think when we feel different, we immediately sort of isolate and, and assume that nobody shares our identity. So, you know, to be depriving people of the ability to see, I mean, thank goodness for social media in this respect, right? I mean, there's a lot of problems with it, but it has revolutionized the coming out process and also the gender identity conversation, expression. I mean, it's literally, you know, it is a whole world that we didn't, I didn't have. Me either. (laughs) Um, I didn't even know that was possible. So that is so important to protect. Yeah, absolutely. All right. The second story this week comes from the Peggy Guggenheim collection in Venice, which has a new double meaning program that offers inclusive tours for blind, partially sighted and sighted visitors that includes tactile reproductions of artwork along with descriptive sheets in Braille and high legibility characters. I love this. So incredible. We've gone through a lot of our materials and uh, as a company, like been trying to educate ourselves about how to colors to use, fonts to utilize or not utilize, spacing, content, um, even, you know, paying attention to neurodiversities, both, you know, on our team and also in our audiences to give information in a variety of ways so that we, not just those of us who are neurodiverse, but honestly, all kinds of learners, you know, we take in information differently. And, you know, I foresee a day when this is going to be a new best practice, what they're doing um, and a requirement. And I and I look forward to that day. But I admit fully that there's so much I don't know. And I try to be really transparent about that to normalize the fact that, you know, we are learning. We are all learning. Um, and remember that a third of us will have uh, a disability at some point in our lifetimes as well. So, you know, remembering this is a part of us already, you know, it's a part of our world, part of our team, whether we know it or not, the fear and the stigma around disclosure of identity is really what gets in the way, particularly in the workforce. And it, that, it's a lot like LGBTQ identity. Yeah. In fact, they share a lot in common. The stigma is still strong and the fear of retaliation and lost opportunity is um, very real. So we have a hard time even just counting the folks with disabilities in the modern workforce because of that fear on the employee engagement surveys and HR um, data collection processes. Um, So it's hard to, you know, to, again, to our earlier point, standing up and being counted is actually part of the change, you know, and, but we are, we are acknowledging there's a lot of risk to doing that depending on who you work for, where you work in the world, how immature, your organization is, how much sure your manager is. Because yeah. honestly, it comes down to that manager holding the keys to your opportunities, your exposure, your future. And it shouldn't be that way, but it is. It is. Um, and so my wish is, boy, I think this is a call to action to really diversify beyond your direct boss, like your network. Make sure that you're constantly creating relationships with as many people as possible so that, you know, it's not up to one person's bias or lack of of self-awareness, you know, and they hold your future in their hands. It's very important to, you know, diversify that support team, your sort of personal board of directors, if you will. Great career advice, really great career advice. And I'll have to say, I am privileged to not need this and that can change in an instant. And so one more reason that I'm grateful that this exists Okay. The third story this week is from historic furniture manufacturer Stickley, which has been actively hiring refugees 
in the company's 1,600 person workforce in New York, constituting 50% of the company, 23 nationalities, and great employee retention. I mean, they're just coll- checking a lot of boxes. This is something that Chobani does actively as well. And I just think it's so, so smart. That's so beautiful. helpful. We talk about an incentive to, I mean, I'm, I, I literally shift the way I look at my purchasing decisions, you know, with furniture. Yeah. I mean, you've told exactly. me all I need to know. <laughs> uh, exactly. You know, right. And it used to be, you know, we have a lot of brands failing the LGBTQ community, some of which I will not mention <laughs> <laughs> that we have really believed in for a long time and put a lot of stock in, right. In the yeah. same way. So What I love about this story is that, again, we can kind of open our aperture as a community and it used to be only, oh, well, who's LGBTQ plus community friendly. Mm -hmm. But but this story around what they're doing for refugees and looking at their workforce and same with them, the formerly incarcerated is another enormous Mm, powerful that has a very difficult time getting hired that shouldn't. So much talent, so much diversity. Yep. Literally, it's like every time I hear somebody say, oh, we have a pipeline problem and we can't find the diverse talent. It's, it's yeah. like there's this whole extremely motivated and loyal workforce possible. And yet we cannot figure out a way to change our HR system so that people don't get screened out automatically Yeah, because of that one detail. So um, I love this. I, I don't know about you, but that just gave me, you know. Yeah, direction for my spending, and and honestly, that's that's it's not why businesses do it. I hope, but it is a huge benefit uh, to them doing it, and and uh, and I think we need to pay paying attention to all of these some sometimes unheralded moves. Like sometimes we don't even know about stories like this, which is you know, and mm-hmm. it's going on behind the scenes because a brand is very humble about it, or it's just what how they how they roll. Um, yeah. So too, I think we need to be looking on, you know, on the hunt for those that don't crow about it, that are doing really amazing, innovative things. Well, if anyone listening or watching works for one of those brands, a little less uh, or a little more humble, <laughs> please, and is, has something really cool to share, I would love to talk about it here on on Five Things because I oh, I mean, it's it easy it's easy to find the headlines, you know, but sometimes some of these more obscure stories. It requires a hunt for me. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. So uh, next story is about the increase in interest in job postings by companies offering abortion-related travel reimbursement and benefits. So these are companies that are seeing more people apply, despite the fact that there are uh, some ratings for senior management and company culture that have dropped. So, you know, I think that what what we what we see here with this type of data is that extending reproductive benefits can really attract a more diverse workforce. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, it it reminds me of uh, as a company treats sort of one community, it treat it often tends to have sort of an ethos Mm -hmm. of of really, you know, walking the talk and I think this speaks to not just literally the, do I get those health care services if I work for this company? It speaks to the values overall of the company, the commitments that it holds to like protecting, if you will, employees of all identities. And they will, they will do so imperfectly. I'm not saying that it's ever perfect. It never is. But I think that, um, you know, you know, friendly companies on this issue have probably a lot of equity already earned and in the bank and many years of working because you don't just come at this kind of benefit lightly. Yeah. You know, this is something that is very controversial to even provide. So yeah. the thing I would imagine that's happened internally is these these are these are either really easy decisions because everyone's been at the work for a long time and it's like well of course we would do that. Why wouldn't we? And the smart ones are diff- using it to differentiate themselves because right. it's still a, a war for talent. It's still a tight market. Yeah. But, you know, they're willing to put themselves in the crosshairs. And um, again, you know, Bernadette, it kind of think it's like these new issues. You know, we, we I've been so focused on LGBTQ plus friendly brands and um, and they've come and gone. But I, to me, a company that offers something like this is, is is sort of equally impressive to me, and it's something that like rises to my attention. And the assumption is, you know, this is probably a progressive organization that's going to do very well with the workforce um, coming in because inclusion is one of the top values of not just millennial but Gen Z, the oldest of whom are 
27, 28. Yeah. So if you think about, they know their demographic, I'm sure too. Mm -hmm. uh, so well, you know, all this is very strategic and savvy, but I, I do think it's probably safe to say if we looked under the hood, we would find a lot of really good work happening at companies that offer this proactively and, and talk about it and good for them. And may they flourish and get the brightest, the best yes. and brightest talent. They deserve it. <laughs> Absolutely. I completely agree. Okay. The last story this week comes from the Philadelphia Eagles in the National Football League, which is collaborating with Popcorn for the People to build a popcorn concession stand that will employ adults with autism and those who have intellectual disabilities. So about 85% of individuals on the autism spectrum are unemployed. So this is aiming to close that gap just a little bit in Philadelphia. Excellent. Nice Love story. It. Yeah. I really, mean, really good. Feel a good story, like real impact. You know, back to our point about all kinds of neurodiversities. Um, I, I just literally every day I feel like I speak to somebody, I'm catching up with somebody and they say, I, oh, I just was diagnosed. Mm. So it's really interesting to imagine how widespread actually neurodiversity is un unbeknownst to organizations in their current workforce, let alone a hiring strategy that prioritizes that. But, you know, for everyone listening here, if you don't know the, the ways in which you can create a neurodiverse friendly recruitment process, interviewing process, resumes, you know, um, interviewing uh, skills for managers, and then onboarding and, you know, then all the way towards retention of employees, which would include affinity group um, investments in, you know, particular efforts, not just to recruit, but you must retain as well. But there are, there are very sophisticated efforts going on at like Microsoft and Dell tends to be a lot of the tech companies, at least that I know of. Procter but, and Gamble too. Yeah. So it's really, it's a movement and yeah. it's really exciting to see. And there's, um, people with disabilities, uh, founders and business owners and entrepreneurs getting certified as a disability owned firm, just like mm -hmm. you know, certified LGBT and woman owned. Yep. So, you know, this is a thing that's, that's happening. It's here. I won't even say it's coming. It's here. But I think again, the companies that really like lean into this are going to benefit both, you know, to keeping the best people, getting the best people, and then enabling people to do their best work, um, and really bettering the whole culture because we can learn a lot from the conversation about how do I learn, how do I take information in, how does how do our meetings effective for me? What do I need to be successful? What accommodations do I need? Those are all helpful for all of us. It's called universal design. Mm -hmm. It means that, you know, does something designed for someone who don't who, for whom the system doesn't work actually improves our experience of the system across the board. And so we should be leaning into this heavy and saying, you know, okay, what can this teach us about how we need to change our, our structures? So great, great advice. And as more companies start to embrace neurodiversity, you can bet I'll be writing about it in five things. So thank you so much for joining me today, Jennifer. Can you tell folks how they can get in touch with you? Absolutely. Thanks for you. having me. This was so fun. I love this format. Uh, I met at Jennifer Brown Consulting or Jennifer Brown Speaks. Dot com uh, on LinkedIn. You'll find me. I'm at Jennifer Brown Speaks on Instagram, on X, I suppose. I say that? <laughs> Ugh, at Jennifer Brown. Um, and uh, yes, absolutely engage with us and um, join our mailing list. We do a lot of really neat programs on some of the topics we've talked about today. And we consult to, to companies to build their strategy and their affinity groups and ERGs. And I speak and write books. And I love that as an ex performer, the stage is my home. So I get to, I get to work within my passions and my competencies or incompetencies. Yeah. <laughs> We're always learning every day. So thanks, Brenda. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and folks check out Jennifer's podcast as well. The will to change. And also another call to action is another podcast recommendation called fixable hosted by my Shiro's spouses and leadership experts, Ann Morris and Francis Fry. And by the way, speaking of that, Jennifer, you're one of my sheroes as well. And I just have so much respect and admiration for you. And so it's really a delight to have you on the show. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks for that. Yeah. And folks who don't already get the five things newsletter, you can subscribe at five things, .com. Thanks and have a great week. Thank you for listening to five things in 15 minutes. 
I hope you found yourself inspired by at least one of this week's stories. If you did, would you mind sharing it with a colleague and leaving us a review on your favorite podcasting platform? And if you don't already get my Five Things newsletter, join at fivethingsdei.com. I'm Bernadette Smith, and I'll see you next week right here for Five Things in 15 Minutes, bringing good vibes to DEI. DEI.